never say never is a statement dignified to those whose dreams are never seen as grim to grip for their conviction in self is all there is to make what many may deem impossible possible James Nkata lived from Busubizi TTC in 1968 to 1972 and Buwalasi Teachers College in 1980 to 1982 amidst part-time teaching at various primary schools to upgrade his academic career and later acquire a PhD in higher education management at Makari University in 1996 after attaining a postgraduate diploma in management sciences and a master's in education from Moray House College University in Edinburgh in 1987 to 1990. Dr. James Nkata is married with children. He intends to retire when his current contract as Director General UMI ends in 2024. People and power, we do welcome you back. My name is Mebo Twegumiezake on Twitter. The hashtag is NBS People and Power. This episode belongs to the sixth Director General of the Uganda Management Institute, sixth to serve in that position, and of course, still serving for 11 years and still counting, Dr. James Nkata, who is also the founder of the East African Institute of Higher Education Studies and Research at Makere University. Welcome back. Thank you. Okay. Now, have your achievements in academia answered your life's satisfactions? To a large extent, you have answered my life's satisfaction. See, in academics, you become satisfied when your expertise is recognized and utilized. Mm -hmm. I must say, my expertise in academics, especially in the area of management, has been recognized mm. and uh, it's being used. So whenever I'm called upon to provide either technical input into something, to teach, or to talk about management, I get satisfied. Mm -hmm. I have published books, I've published articles in referral journals, I've given talks, and I've even prepared conference papers present those conference papers. I have done consultancies and I have been given some awards, some of which you can see in this office here. Mm -hmm. It's because of recognition. Now whenever we get recognized in academics, you feel satisfied yeah. and you feel a person of value. What I'm trying to say is that in academics we recognize value. Mm -hmm. As long as society values what you are, you get satisfied. And for us in academics, we want our academic works and what we are in our various specialities mm. to be valued and to be recognized. Mm. But my personal satisfaction is that what I have been and what I have done in academics have added value to this country. What have you been most proud of when it's come to probably your contribution in academia where you felt this I did and this probably shaped society or it actually impacted? In my career, I initiated several programs in the management of higher education that many higher education experts you have in this country have benefited from it. Mm -hmm. And they are where they are because of those programs. I have also in the same way sourced for projects, both in my career I did, and uh, many projects came to my career and brought in a lot of foreign money and in UMI. And uh, I get satisfied when I see the results of these projects mm -hmm. that have contributed immensely to the higher education sector in this country. For example, we initiated a project where we had to train lecturers how to teach. Okay. In the universities, in my career. That project was funded by the, the Norwegians. And then the Finnish also came. I sourced the money from the Finnish government and from the Norwegian government and they mounted a program. It was not easy because 
getting a professor who has been toying for 20 years to say, I'm going to teach you how to teach. <laughs> yeah. It was not easy. But at the end of the day, we are successful and we mounted the pedagogical training mm -hmm. for the first time in the university. And many lecturers came and attended. And I went home and I felt very happy, say, I've been an impact. So the teaching started improving in the university mm. because of that program. That's, that's one example. Mm. We have written books addressing some of the issues that are affecting the Uganda's education system. And the people have read them and referred it to them. In fracture wise, I'm very proud because wherever I have been, I've left some infrastructure development. I can give you an example. When I was in a big district as a, a district education officer, uh, it was me who first built an independent structure for the Department of Education in that district, and I left it there. But when I came to Makerele, we struggled hard to have a home for the East African Institute of Higher Education Studies and Research. And it was started in some of funny garages and the <laughs> workshops <laughs> in one of the buildings in Makerele University. With the help of Professor Sekama, who was the Dean of School of Education by then, we established an institution. So I left an infrastructure, well constructed there, well mm -hmm. transformed into garages. Mm -hmm. Up to today, it's one of the best structures in that school. And when I came to UMI here, I don't want to say or to pride myself. Mm -hmm. You can see by yourself. Mm -hmm. This place has changed from what it was about 15, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. This building where we are today, see, through efforts with my colleagues in the institute and the help of government, I've been able to put up this. So I'm proud of that. But most importantly, I'm proud of the products that have gone through my hand. Okay. Yeah. And if I'm to take you back a little bit, what would explain probably your move from primary or even secondary mm -hmm. teaching mm -hmm. into higher education? As I told you earlier, at our time, a person who went to, into a teacher's college was the cream of the system. The most intelligent. So, having been a primary school teacher, I had a foundation of understanding that level as a teacher. When I became a secondary school teacher, I had an opportunity of understanding that level. Mm -hmm. When I became a university lecturer, I have an opportunity of knowing what a university lecturer is. Mm -hmm. and then? I, then I go to administration. <laughs> I was a director, now I'm director general. So I, I have known the dynamics of all the levels of the system, yeah. right from a primary school <coughs> up to university, <coughs> then you go into administration. But one thing that I want to tell you is that sometimes people look at you and say, this was a primary school teacher, what does he know? Mm. Even if you have got a master's and somebody has an S6 certificate, she would say, no, no, he was a primary school teacher. How can he say so? Forgetting that a primary school teacher was a starting point, mm -hmm. a stepping stone. And the knowledge is gained as you grow up. Mm -hmm. And you don't develop yourself. So a person who met me 40 years ago, he may look at me the way he looked at me when I was a grade two teacher. But now I'm a different person, at a different level, different knowledge, and different status. But that is the problem with many people. They do things. One time, I, I met a friend and asked me, where are you? By then I was in Makere. He said, I was in Makere. What are you doing? Are there primary schools in Makere? Are you in Makere primary school? That's what he was, <laughs> was asking me. I told him, no, I'm in the faculty of education. He said, what, what are you doing? They said, I'm teaching. So you mean they take primary school teachers there? <laughs> I asked him, my, my, my friend, I'm no longer primary school. I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher now, a teacher of a different level, <laughs> not in a primary school. Okay, that's so funny. you could see that if you start y your career <laughs> in a humble way and you grow up, yeah. some people tend to look at you from the perspective as to where you started <laughs> and take you like that. It takes them time to believe that you are a different person now. 
But what, what is very important is what you do. Yeah. You see, when you get a qualification, you don't sing about it. Mm. You demonstrate what you are through, what you do. And that's what you do. And that's what I did. So people can say, you wear this. Are you still this? But tomorrow when you read somewhere, it says, oh, this man is now director general of Uganda Management Institute. What does it do? It produces postgraduate people. So but this was the primary school teacher. No, no, no. <laughs> that is a different person. Yes, so never, you see, my brief in life is that every human being has got a potential. Even a madman on the street mm. has a potential. So never judge a person by what he is currently. Judge a person by what is likely to be tomorrow. Yeah. Then you will be able to live a comfortable life in this world. That's a good lesson. Yeah. It's a good lesson. <laughs> so let's uh, talk about the development of Uganda's higher education. Probably get an expert's point of view in terms of your assessment. Yeah. Yeah, in the development of Uganda higher education system, I would say, as it is now, it has gone through turbulence. Mm -hmm. It has gone through turbulence because two, three things. One, this quest for degrees. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to get a degree. And the people have reduced high education to mean the universities. Universities are just part of higher education. Because higher education uh, is post-secondary education, post-A-level. Yeah. But when you talk about higher education, people look at universities. Only. Only. They forget about the tertiary. It has also gone to, 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 to an extent where even our policy makers think higher education means universities. University. That's why they are putting a lot of emphasis of establishing universities instead of establishing higher educational institutions with diversity. And that has been a problem. So what you call development, higher education development in this country, is university development. In fact, universities are much more than other institutions. Many countries, for example, in the US, the backbone of the U.S. economy are the community colleges, not universities. Mm -hmm. And their higher education system, for them, they have got uh, separate higher education systems per a group of universities or a group of institutions. So going back at your question, the rush into establishing universities, according to me, is killing or it, it, it's killing the meaning of higher education and reducing higher education as a sector to university education, which is not true. Mm. And let me go to one other important point, is the establishment of universities in these countries. Universities, they are just only, they are not made, they develop. But for us, we make them, mm -hmm. and that's the problem. So what would be the solution? The solution is one. Well. Yeah. yeah, if you were to actually write a report, send a report to we, we the go, Ministry of Education. We should go back to the drawing table and ask ourselves questions. How do we grow universities? In high education, universities are grown. You cannot wake up in the morning, you, you build a building of two floors, and you say, I get a license to start a university. No. In other countries, it does not happen. What they do, they start institutions. And you grow that institution into a university. The likes of YMCA? Very good. On which you are actually yes. the chairman, executive committee. Yeah. YMCA, we started the one day uh, the tertiary institution. It has grown now into university. And uh, I, I advised my people in YMCA 
we shall not apply for university status. Let us apply for other degree awarding institution so that we can grow other degree awarding institution into a university when the foundation has been laid. So when you ask about growth of higher education in this country, mm -hmm. that's where the problem lies. It's that to reduce higher education to mean universities and neglect other areas of higher education. Mm -hmm. Now I'm happy the government is going back to the drawing table. Mm -hmm. They are trying to put more emphasis now on mm -hmm. tertiary and uh, technical education institutions. And that's the way to go. Now you've grown into your career path from just an administrator into a powerful motivational speaker. Always giving keynote addresses in mm -hmm. different places. Mm -hmm. How would you say, or how have you even transformed yourself into that kind of a personality over the years? You see, motivational speaking is, is informed by your personal lived experiences. Because you cannot motivate people to live what you have not lived. It's impossible. So you have to go through lived experiences, you draw examples and experiences, then you construct them into a speech or into a written uh, something. Then you become a motivational speaker. So you cannot be a good motivational speaker unless you have lived experiences and you are also a motivational person in the way you, you are and the way you talk. So that is the key mm -hmm. to motivational speaking. Okay. Yeah. Is it probably something that, because... Mm, Earlier, you kept talking about pursuing your dream, yeah. which started with teaching, yeah. into where you are today. Yeah, most, and, um, mm -hmm. most motivational speakers are, are, are chasers of dreams. <laughs> they chase dreams. And when they go to speak, they narrate their story. Which brings me to my next question. Yes. Where are you chasing the next dream after you am I? Is it really into retirement? Of course. <laughs> is, that an, is that an honest answer? Yes, I want to retire. It's after contributing for 40 something years <laughs> to the development of this country, I need to see the people who have gone through my hands taking over. I don't want to say that I don't have the energy to do so. Mm. But you see, in life, there is always an end of something. Then you pursue other things. Personally, I'm proud to say I've enjoyed what I've been doing and I'm doing today. I want to retire, sit down, and remain a happy man. Allow me to say that you are a think tank, and this country probably still needs maybe using even probably is a, is a wrong word, would still need the wisdom that you would have. For example, when we were speaking about higher education in particular, so if you were maybe, let's say, called to serve in a ministry or even in politics in particular, you've never had any interest in doing that? Politics is out of my ambition. <laughs> okay. And I have reasons why I don't want to be a politician and I hate politics. Why? But uh, other areas, say for example, being of value when after retirement, mm -hmm. I believe in that. Mm -hmm. And after retirement, I go into writing books, publishing them, giving speeches, attending conferences. That's what retired people do. <laughs> and if I have money traveling all over the world. Okay. But as I told you earlier, I enjoy farming. Mm -hmm. And that's where I want to retire to. We'll find you in Wachiso. Yes. <laughs> You're still watching People and Power. This episode belongs to the Director General Uganda Management Institute, Dr. James Nkata. We'll return shortly. <laughs>